Okay, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start now. Uh, <coughs> I hope everyone is able to uh, gone through some of the codes which we run in uh, session two. And if you were having some difficulties, I hope other people were able to help or you were able to resolve those issues over last two days. So today is uh, our last session uh, in the, this three week, uh, three session webinar series. And what we are going to do today is we will start with uh, one of the code which we left over from the session two. And then uh, we will go over, Melanie will go over uh, other Python codes to actually read, extract, and uh, more or like do the similar uh, task, but uh, performing those tasks on OMI, NO2, and SO2 data sets. Okay. After that, towards the end, uh, we will also go over some of the new and upcoming uh, air quality satellite uh, missions uh, which will help the provide more information on air quality uh, reg at regional level and at global level so with that uh, let me quickly go over the last uh, script which we left over so this specific python script is to create air quality maps and uh, I just want to actually show this. The purpose of this script is to read the modest level aerosol to data file uh, from the HDF format and create a PM 2.5 air quality category map using relationship between AOD and PM 2.5. Uh, this code works both at 10 kilometer and three kilometer product. And there is a big disclaimer here. Uh, since as we discussed in session one, the relationship between AOD and PM 2.5 does varies over location to location, over season to season, and it's not always linear. <clears throat> In this specific code, we are assuming that the relationship is linear and it can be, AOD can be converted into PM 2.5 using a simple regression equation which has a slope and intercept. So this code, merely what it does is, mm, take the slope and intercept either from the users or default. The default uh, slope and intercept which we have provided in this uh, script is based on some studies in the US and it's more likely applicable for the US conditions. Uh, still within US, uh, we strongly recommend that you use local source slope and intercept uh, based on your own studies or based on the literature uh, this code is just to provide you an example of how to take AOD and calculate the PM 2.5 and convert that into air quality categories, which is good, moderate, unhealthy. And these categories are defined based on EPA's guideline, US EPA's guideline. Uh, and as you know, <clears throat> Other countries might have their own guidelines, so you might want to check those. So we will uh, talk about those. Just want to give this this big disclaimer that this is just an example. Please do not use this code uh, without uh, proper uh, making changes to the slope and intercept relationship. This is good for qualitative purpose, but for quantitative purpose, I strongly recommend that you use your local slope and intercept and other information if possible. With that, let me go over to the Python console, which we used last time. Uh, we are going to use same Anaconda, the spider Python uh, editor, which we used. And I'm going to just quickly go over the steps which we have gone last time. So there are two parts. On the left is your Python, uh, where the Python codes will dis uh, uh, display on the right side you will see python ipython console and you can see the name here in the blue on the bottom of the page so you can see actually here the ipython console 
this is the area where you will run the code this is the area where you will open the your code okay now the one command which we did last time was uh, if i click on the ipython console and type r p w d apparently i have to change this to the pointer in order to type so it will show the current directory where my codes are there uh, if it is not you can change it if it is not there that that's okay actually what you can do is again go on the left side on the top left there is a folder option which says open file i'll click on that since i have already changed my directory by default it goes to the my directory and in this directory we have gone through four out of these five codes and the one which we are going now is called read and aod read aod and calculate pm 2.5.py everybody is there go to the laptop open folder select the file and say open the code run exactly in the same way as it does for other codes which we have run it will it will read the file from the file to, file list dot text so here is on line 23 is that line where the file list dot text is read uh, some people last time had trouble i hope they were able to resolve that in creating this file and will be able to run today so i have two files in this right now uh, here is my uh, here is my file list dot text and i can see there are two files one is three kilometer and one is 10 kilometer and we'll run on those so let's run the code first and then i'll go over some part of the code where you can modify to so first again to run i'll go on the top of the screen there's a green arrow and that's to run the code so i will just click that green arrow and then the code started running on the right side of ipython console and where i will see would you like to process this file name it's exactly the same way as we did the last week we have tried to create all the code in a similar fashion so that there's less confusion about how they will run again i want to process i will put quotes why on in the quotes if you are running 2.7 you have to use the quotes uh, once i do it will display some information about the file and the aod values within the file this is similar information which you uh, get when you're running other python codes in the week in the session two we looked about so it says this is a three kilometer modis file here is some information valid file aod range latitude longitude range and other information <clears throat> now this is important it's asking would you like to enter a slope and intercept for the pm 2.5 calculation again remember this is from those PM 2.5 equal to slope multiplied by AOD in plus intercept. So this is the equation we are using. So if I have a slope and intercept, I can say yes. If I do not have, then I will say no. So for default, we will run with both slope and intercept and without. So I want to create without with the default slope and intercepts. I will say no. If I say no, it will take the default value of slope and intercept which i will show you in a minute inside the code now the next question is would you like to create map of this data i will say yes and then press enter and then it goes through read the aod and calculate the pm 2.5 and will come up with the map like this so what you see here is it just took every single pixels of aerosol optical depth multiply those with the slope value which is already hard coded in the code you can also provide that and then 
added intercept value and once you get the pm 2.5 value you can calculate these categories which i will show you in the code how to do that but this is air quality map it shows the red colors are unhealthy uh, moderate yellow and the greens are good and then there are other colors and this is again showing the fires during the california now the next question it is asking is do you want to save it so i'll say yes this is another <clears throat> next file i will do the same yes i want to do this now it's asking again for whether you want to enter the slope and intercept now this time i want to enter the slope and intercept and i'll say yes so once you say yes it will ask slope value so i'm just going to give some assumed number here let's say 45.5 which is per unit aerosol optical depth pm 2.5 values and then i will say intercept is 5 microgram with respect to zero aerosol optical depth that's what intercept mean here and then i will say yes create the map and then it start creating so you will notice that there is a difference little bit when you change the slope and intercept you can get different types of maps so you want to use the slope and intercept realistic in your region and that will provide you more accurate air quality map and i had to file all the processed i can check again in the directory if those png files are created and i can see actually there are files which are created and i can open those using the uh, any any of the image viewing software everybody is there okay so let me see if uh, you were able to run this so i'm launching a poll and giving you a minute to just see if everybody was able to run this code properly and then we will i will go through the pieces of the code where you want to make changes <clears throat> okay uh, so looks like about 83% uh, people were successful 17% people were not and we will see a little bit on that how what went wrong there so i'm going to close this poll just to go over again uh, now with the code and then i will run one more time for the people who were not able to do it earlier but before that let me go over the code so it's very similar code as you're seeing uh, in aod mapping uh, or during the last session uh, again by default it's taking optical depth land and ocean sds for three kilometer and for 10 kilometer it's taking aod 550 meter dark target deep blue combined sds remember in session two we talked about different sds and why you should select certain sds so here is your option you can change the sds if you want the image sds here you can change the image optical depth and ocean if you want the dark target product here you can change with the dark target if you want the deep blue only you can change to the deep blue uh, if you want uh, combined this is what i selected right now but this is where you will change the sds next important thing about this specific code is the changing the slope and intercept so if you go to the line 104 to 106 this is where the slope and intercepts are defined like i said these are default i have just picked some number from the literature but they may not be applicable for your reasons so please if you are for example in region with very polluted area this slope can be any anywhere 100 or 120 microgram uh, per cubic meter in places like delhi uh, and this intercept can value can also be very high so be careful this is in the u.s condition which is relatively clean conditions uh, and the slope values actually is very low in these cases so this is the place to change the default value the other option is you can enter your sub slope value you uh, from the uh, user interface when you're running the next thing as i mentioned these air quality categories are defined based on the epa guideline and they are 
actually defined in the code starting line 116 and all the way to 123. Now these are the values as defined by EPA. Uh, individual countries might have their own guidelines or you might want to follow WHO guidelines so you can change those whatever the colors they are and whatever the lines uh, whatever the range of PM 2.5 value each category defined. So this is the place you, why you may want to make changes. Uh, all other things are very similar to the other codes which we checked yesterday. The color scales, resolutions are everything you know, very similar to what we saw and you can make those changes in the uh, line, starting with the create map line 125 onward. Okay, so I think that's all I have. I will actually do a quick poll on the session two and this one, and then I will hand over to Melanie to go over uh, OMI data. So this is first poll, and it says select one that applies to you about session two Python codes. So uh, when I say session two, that includes the code which I just ran about air quality. So just go ahead and uh, vote for this. And then uh, there's one more poll and then we'll move on. Okay, so let me share. So there were 4% people who did not try at all. About 10% people had some technical problem. 65% people were run all code successfully. Uh, there were few people who had actually problem with either one or more codes. So please uh, try to work through these. Uh, there is enough instruction on the PPTs uh, uh, which are provided along with this uh, to resolve some of the information, uh, some of the issues you might have. Uh, the last thing is you can email us if you are not able to get your solution either by searching internet or by talking to other people. Okay, so the last poll I have here is this. select all that applies. So here in this poll, you can select more than one actually. So you can select one or more of the following, so whichever applies to you. And I'm closing the poll now. So I had 76% people voted and 64% people says I'm able to run all code successfully. 46% people were able to change the SDS name. About the same percentage of people were able to change the color scale and looks like about 20 to 35% people will need more help in running the codes or modifying the codes. So we will try to help you, but uh, we'll strongly recommend that you go through some of the PPT, follow the instructions, uh, and make sure your computer is suitable to run all this uh, with all the permissions and all the packages are installed. If still you cannot uh, do it, uh, then please write to us and we will try to resolve this. So with that, uh, I will hand over to Melanie and then she will start the next part of the uh, training. Thank you. Hello, my name is Melanie Follett Cook, and I'm going to be uh, going over session three uh, read, map, and extract level two, OMI, NO2, and SO2. So, this session is going to be structured very similarly to the last session that Paul ended covering MODIS data. I'm going to give a brief overview of the OMI instrument and the relevant data products before going through each of the Python codes. The ozone monitoring instrument, or OMI, is a hyperspectral imager that observes solar backscatter radiation in the visible and ultraviolet wavelengths. The Earth is viewed in 740 wavelength bands with a spectral resolution of about 0.5 nanometers. OMI is on board the Aura satellite, which has a low Earth orbit at about 705 kilometers above the Earth. 
and it has an equator crossing time of about 1.45 p.m. The satellite track has a large swath, large enough to provide global coverage in about 14 orbits per day. However, the row anomaly experienced by OMI has blocked several rows, and we'll talk about more talk more about that in just a minute. The nominal resolution of OMI is 13 by 24 kilometers squared, and several available products are listed here and include total and troposphere column ozone, NNO2, AOD in the UV, and total column formaldehyde and SO2. Each OMI product file is called a data granule and covers the sunlit portion of the orbit with approximately 2,600 kilometer wide swath containing 60 binned pixels or scenes per viewing line. During normal operations, 14 or 15 granules are produced daily, providing full coverage of the globe every day. This is in contrast to aerosol observations that are made at much higher spatial resolution. Here, an entire orbit, which is about 90 minutes, is contained in one file. Whereas for MODIS, some products are available in five minute increments because the data volume is so high. The OMI row anomaly is the result of a hardware issue on the satellite. It started in about 2008 and has resulted in a loss of data that is illustrated but exaggerated on the figure on the right. In reality, um, the orbits will overlap uh, towards the poles at higher latitudes. This slide shows the structure of an OMI data file name. First part in purple shows the instrument ID, in this case, OMI Aura. This peach color shows the data type, and for our purposes, that's the level two OM NO2 or OM SO2, if you're reading the SO2 file names. Next in green is the observation date and time. First, you have the four digit year, followed by an M, followed by a two digit month and day. Next is a T and the time in GMT in two digit hours and then minutes. Next in blue is an O followed by the orbit number. In brown is the collection or version number. In our case, we're gonna be looking at version three. Next in gray is the production or processing date and time. And that is in the same format as the observation time, except that the time goes to seconds instead of minutes. All of these files can be read using various tools, such as the ones listed here, but they, they can't be opened with something like a text editor. They need special software. The OMI NO2 and SO2 files are HDF5 files and should therefore be able to be read by any software that can read uh, NetCDF4 files. The, the OMI NO2 level two files contain a single swath called column amount NO2 or OMI total column amount SO2. These are composed of a geolocation fields group and a data fields group. And we'll see more about this when we're looking at the Python codes. So for today, we'll be focusing on two products that are relevant to air quality. Nitrogen, nitrogen dioxide plays a key role in atmospheric chemistry by controlling the production of tropospheric ozone, forming aerosol nitrates, and affecting the abundance of the hydroxyl radical, OH, and therefore influencing the lifetimes of greenhouse gases. NO2 is one of the pollutants regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency as it is detrimental to human health and ecosystems. Sources of NO2 include combustion, soil emissions, lightning, and fires. The relatively short lifetime of NO2, which is about hours to days, leads to large concentrations in the lowest level of the atmosphere, called the planetary boundary layer, with respect to higher levels of the atmosphere. Because of this short lifetime, it also has large spatial gradients around its sources. And for this reason, NO2 observations from space have commonly been used to constrain bottom-up emission inventories of NO2. 
Sulfur dioxide is also an EPA criteria pollutant and has been linked to adverse respiratory effects. It can also form secondary sulfate particles through chemical reactions in the atmosphere, as well as contribute to acid deposition. The primary sources of SO2 are volcanoes and coal and oil burning. This is a table reviewing the different quantities these trace gas abundances are expressed in. NO2 and SO2 from OMI are expressed as column quantities. So to review, you can think of an atmospheric column as a vertical pillar defined by some unit on the Earth's surface and bounded by the top of the atmosphere. These are typically expressed as the number of molecules in the column per square area. In our case, it's gonna be centimeter squared. A Dobson unit, which is what the SO2 columns are expressed in, is defined as the thickness of a layer of pure gas, which would be formed by the total column amount, but at standard temperature and pressure. So one Dobson unit is equal to the number of molecules needed to create a pure layer of gas, 0 .0 0 0.01 millimeters thick at standard temperature and pressure. So column ozone is, is something that's usually expressed in terms of Dobson units. So a typical column ozone amount is about 300 Dobson units. This would correspond to a three millimeter layer of pure ozone at the surface of the earth if its temperature and pressure were at, uh, were at standard temperature and pressure. Um, you can easily convert from molecules per centimeter squared to Dobson units with the conversion shown here on your screen. So these are uh, some relevant variables contained in the OM NO2 files. All NO2 in the atmosphere column is found in the troposphere, which is the low, lowest level of the atmosphere closest to the surface, or the stratosphere, which is the level above the troposphere that contains the ozone layer. The OM NO2 retrieval algorithm retrieves both the stratospheric and the tropospheric column amount. Column amount NO2 trope is the estimated tropospheric column amount of NO2, while column amount NO2 strat, which is not written here, um, is the estimated stratospheric column amount of NO2. As Pawan explained in the first session, a retrieval algorithm is made up of the satellite observations as well as a priori information usually obtained from a model. Over unpolluted areas with very low values of NO2, so say over the open ocean when there are very few sources, the retrieved tropospheric column NO2 value is dominated by the a priori or model and can also be affected by the assumptions made about, you know, what's stratospheric versus what's tropospheric air. As a result, many of these values over these unpolluted areas are, can be small negative numbers. This is important because when you're computing statistics such as mean, median, variance, it's important to include all of these valid measurements, regardless of their sign, in order to avoid statistical biases. The OMINO2 documentation advises looking at several parameters in order to filter the data, rather than looking at any uncertainty variable contained within the file. If we remember that each OMI viewing line contains 60 pixels across. Users are advised to only use rows 4 to 54, where that first row equals zero. Um, we probably remember from, maybe I can just go back. So if we look, you can see the pixel, these pixels at the edge of the swath are going to be much longer than at the center, which is near Nader. So they're advising you sort of cut out the rows, uh, those pixels at the beginning and the end of the swath. Users are also advised to use only scenes where the radiative cloud fraction is less than 0.5, the solar zenith angle is less than 85 degrees, and the terrain reflectivity is less than 0.3. The terrain reflectivity is a measure of how reflective the surface of the Earth is. This is unitless and must be multiplied by a scale factor of 0 0.001 to obtain the actual number. The cloud radiance fraction is an estimate of the fraction of photons reaching the satellite instrument that come from the cloud covered parts of the scene. 
This is also unitless and must be multiplied by a scale factor of 0 0.001 also to obtain the actual number. The solar zenith angle is the angle between the zenith and the center of the sun's disk, where the zenith is the imaginary point directly above you at a particular location. The solar zenith angle variable can be found in the geolocation information. And again, we'll look at that more um, when we're looking at the actual Python codes. All of these variables have been filtered for the row anomaly and any observation modes for which this retrieval doesn't perform well. These are indicated by fill values equal to the large negative numbers shown here. So moving on to uh, um, SO2, for each OMI scene, there are four different estimates made of the vertical column density of SO2 in Dobson units. These are obtained by making different assumptions about the vertical distribution of the SO2 plume. The PBL SO2 retrieval is the one most relevant to those concerned with air quality. This retrieval assumes that the center of the SO2 plume is about 0.9 kilometers altitude and is most appropriate for studies concerned with near surface pollution. The next is designated as lower troposphere or TRL, where the SO2 emission peak is at three kilometers. And this corresponds most closely with industry outflow or degassing volcanoes. The second is, uh, sorry, the third is uh, mid troposphere or TRM and is associated with an emission peak at eight kilometers corresponding to plumes from moderate eruptions. And the last is lower stratosphere, or STL, where the emission peak is at 18 kilometers and corresponds to explosive volcanic eruptions. I wanna emphasize that each retrieval listed here yields total column values and represents only a different assumption of the SO2 plume height. So these should never be added together. But if you know the plume height, um, a user can interpolate between these values. This slide lists the most relevant variables in the OM SO2 files. For the SO2 retrievals, the current documentation doesn't recommend using the included quality flags. They say that while they might provide some information, they're a little bit too restrictive. So, they have uh, advice similar to what we saw for the NO2 files. They recommend users to use other parameters such as solar zenith angle and radiative cloud fraction. So similar to the NO2 retrieval, for the PBL retrieval, users are advised to only use rows four to 54 where the first row equals zero. This again prevents using the very large pixels on either edge of the swath. Users are also advised to use only scenes where the radiative cloud fraction is less than 0.3 and the solar zenith angle is less than 70 degrees. The radiative cloud fraction variable is analogous to the cloud radiance fraction variable from the NO2 files, except no scale factor is needed within the SO2 files. And again, the solar zenith angle is uh, in the geolocation fields. For the volcanic retrievals, the TRL, TRM, and STL, all rows can be used, but users should still only use retrievals from scenes with a solar zenith angle less than 70 degrees. Okay, so this, this session is going to use um, Windows to use Python. So I will first show you where I have all of my codes. So within this directory, hopefully you were able to download the session three code data zip file. In case you were not, it can be found on the training website. Here is where you download it. And within this is contained three uh, OMI files, two NO2 and one SO2 as well as several different Python codes 
<clears throat> and I went ahead and uh, attached a file list dot text. So these all the OMI files, the Python scripts, and the file list dot text should all be in the same directory somewhere on your computer. To start Anaconda, I go to the start menu and click Anaconda. And for anybody that was having trouble potentially installing the packages, this is the where you would find the Anaconda prompt with which to install the packages. Right now, we're going to click on Anaconda Navigator. And it always takes a little bit of a second to start. OK. So now we are going, similar to what Pawan showed, we're going to launch Spider. To look at our editor. So Spider is going to look almost pretty much identical to what you've been seeing with Pawan. This. So right here, I have the file explorer up. Um, right now, you can you can change the panes that you're viewing through View, Panes, and right now I am looking at the editor. The IPython console will actually be running the codes and the file explorer. So here I'm going to go to this is my working directory. And the first code I'm going to open is the list, the SDS. So here I have my Python code on the left. And oh. OK. So here is where file list.txt is located. So if you have a different file name, you can just change this. To run, you just click the green arrow. And so we'll just, I'll, I'll go through this a little bit probably faster than Pawan did, because by now you're probably familiar with the actual running of the different codes. They're all very similar. So for the list SDS, first it shows where the, the file that I'm running, the working directory, and it's asking would I like to process my first file listed in the file list.txt. Um, I'd also like to mention I'm running uh, Python 3.6. so. I don't have to type the quotes around. I can just hit Y and enter. And here it's listing all of the variables or SDS within each of the OMI and O2 files. I'm going to move this up so we can see more of it. What I've also done here is I've altered the code a little bit to show you the dimensions of each of these variables. So 1644 is the number of viewing lines in this orbit. And 60, if you remember, is the number of pixels across the orbit. Um, this is important because when we go to um, export into a CSV file, it's important that each of the variables you choose to export be the same dimension. So you can see if you scroll down something like instrument configuration ID is not the same dimension and it'll, it will make the code crash unfortunately so if you're choosing a variable to export you can use this to make sure that they're all the same dimension so here we can see uh, the relevant variables that we discussed earlier cloud radiance fraction we have column amount oops column amount <laughs> column amount no2 strat column amount no2 trope for troposphere. Scrolling down, we have terrain reflectivity. And I said before, um, we do not see solar zenith angle here. I altered the code and uh, to output only the geolocation SDS, and I'll, I'll run through that very quickly in a minute. 
So we'll say no because these are going to show the exact same variables because this is another NO2 file. And so the next, we will look at the SO2 variables. Um, and actually, one going back very quickly, um, I highlighted essentially only the NO2 troposphere column and the relevant variables you would need to filter it. Um, if you want detailed information about any of these um, any of these other variables, they can be found in the AMNO2 documentation, which is available uh, from the GES DISC website. Um, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later. Okay. So here are the variables for an OMI SO2 file. And again, all of the dimensions are listed here. So we have the column amount SO2 PBL, STL, TRL, and TRM. And remember, these are total columns in the case of SO2. Radiative cloud fraction. And again, the solar zenith angle is in the geolocation information. So I said um, before, I'm just going to I have read OMI and O2 and list SDS, and then I've added this little geo. And what again we'll do is I've changed it here. So if you go, you see list SDS here is the data field group, which uh, if you remember earlier on, I said that within the swath data, the it, it was either, I'm sorry, <laughs> within the swath data, for, for an NO2 file, there is a variable or a group, column amount NO2, or OMI to total column amount SO2. And within each of these groups are two other groups, data fields, shown here, and geolocation. So this code contains the data fields. I've modified it here to in instead print out the geolocation. So you can see where I've commented out the uh, the line that you just saw. And instead, I'm calling on the geolocation fields group. So on this code, it's the same process. What I like to process is OMI NO2 file. Yes. And when you're running this, make sure you click on this window before you hit yes. I'm sure I'll do that. I'm sure I'll forget to do that at some point. So here, is the geolocation information, latitude, longitude, and here we have solar zenith angle. Um, okay, and we'll again skip the next and looking at the SO2, we see similar geolocation information. We see latitude, longitude, and solar zenith angle. Um, OK. I'm seeing that people are getting, people running 2.7 are getting an error. So let me take a pause and see if I can work that out. Let me first, you know what, I'm going to do a poll to see how many people are experiencing this error. Okay, I'm going to launch this poll for just a minute. Okay, I see a lot of people are running into uh, problems running this code with Python 2.7. Somebody, it looks like somebody in the questions was able to fix it by change, by changing line 45. So if you can check the question and answer, um, there might be a fix in there. I'm really, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, but okay, so for now, we'll move on to the next code, which is, 
dumping the ASCII file. So I'm just going to close these and bring up our <coughs> dump ASCII code. This code will output uh, variables to a CSV file, a text file. Um, here on line 28 are the variables to be output, in this case, column amount NO2, column amount NO2 STD, and VCD quality flags. Um, if you needed to output the geolocation information, you would scroll down here to about line 98, where currently it's looking for that name in the data fields group, and you would change that to the geolocation group. So I just ran, um, I just ran the code and saved the OMI NO2 file. And it appears up here in my file explorer. And going to my working directory, I see here is the text document. Clicking on that. And you can see these variables have now been output in a CSV format. And you could import this file into Excel or other software to work with it. So we'll, we'll skip, we'll do the next file as well. And we will say yes again to save the SO2 file. Okay, I'm seeing that uh, there's a fix for the error. Um, uh, so if you want to check the question and answer section, you can probably, up oh. <laughs> in the chat section, um, we have posted the fix for the error in the previous code. We're listing the SDS. So for everybody, um, at this point, I'm going to pause. Um, so if everybody wants to go to the chat, copy in the new line of code, and try rerunning, I'm going to pause, give you a minute or two, and then take another poll to, to make sure that uh, everybody is able to use that, OK? OK, before we start, um, I'm seeing in the chat that some people are getting a tuple error. And this can happen when you're sort of running different kinds of codes back to back. Um, the IPython console remembers variables from other codes. So we, what we can do is before we move on, if you just click the X in the IPython console, it will start a new kernel. So if you're getting a tuple error, Try doing exactly what I just did and then rerunning the code. I actually got this in the last session and that was the that was the issue. Okay, so I'm going to launch another poll to see if people were able to copy in that code fix and rerun. And it looks like about Roughly about 50% are still having an issue. Um, I, okay, if you're still getting the error, I guess I'll, I'll give it another two minutes just to make sure time isn't the factor. But then we're going to move on. If you're still having the error, um, put it in the uh, question box, and if I have, if we have time at the end, we'll we'll try and address this again. So I'm going to give two more minutes just in case people just don't need a, another minute or two to copy that in and try rerunning it. And then we're going to move on to the mapping codes. OK. Um, the next code we're going to go over is to read and map the OMI NO2 and SO2 files. So first, here is, here is that code. Here is where file list.txt is read in. Um, and here is the SDS name that is to be mapped. 
For NO2, it's column amount NO2. For SO2, it's the PBO, column SO2. When we run these codes, so we click the green arrow. Would I like to process the um, NO2 file? Yes. So here is some information about this file. It's listing some statistics. The average of this of the data contained in this file is 3.14 times 10 to the 15th molecules per centimeter squared. It also lists the standard deviation, the median, and the range of latitude and longitude. Would I like to create a map of this data? Yes. And here is the generated map of column amount NO2. Oops. Uh, the title is also listing the file name. And the units are here on the side. So looking at, uh, again, I want to emphasize with the MODIS data, you are looking at sort of a subset of a MODIS swath, whereas one complete orbit is contained in each file of NO2 and SO2. So our next code is going to be checking the values at a given location. So I'll just want to point out here that I'm going to check 100 west and about 30 north. Um, would I like to save this map? Yes. And we can see it appears up here in our, in our file explorer. So going to my working directory, you can see a PNG image has been created. And I can open it here. I'm going to create, I'm, I'm going to process the next NO2 file. Again, here's the information contained within that file, or some statistics about the uh, column NO2 variable. Create a map. And here you can see kind of the effects of the row anomaly, um, most likely creating these fill values in the center of the swath. And again, we'll check the same point, about 100 west, 30 north. Yes, I would like to save this map. And uh, would I like to process the SO2 file? Yes. Now, remember, the SO2 file is in Dobson units. So the average of this, of the SO2 in this file, is 0.144 Dobson units with standard deviation, median, and the latitude longitude range. Would I like to create a map? Yes. Now, this looks much noisier. I'm actually going to save this map, and I'm going to open this image. This is actually the date of some oil fires in Iraq. So it's, it's not high resolution, but you see these low values throughout the swath, but zooming in for this region of the Middle East, you see these very high values as a result of these oil fires, much higher on the scale. So we'll look at that when we pick, um, when we pick a location. So uh, places that you can change this file, again, you can map a different variable by changing the SDS name or NO2 or SO2. The actual plotting is down here. And the color scale is listed here. This GIST stern and then the underscore R indicates it's reversed. So changing the color, you can enter in another color scale name 
And all of this information is in the PowerPoint um, that is available from the training website. Um, a website listing the different, um, actually I can, can go here. So here you can see, you can change the color scale and this GIST Stern color scale that it's using. And this website shows uh, examples of other color scales that you can use. Um, okay, I think we're going to move on to, I'm going to reset my kernel and go to the next code, which is reading the OMI NO2 or SO2 at a given location. So before I want to, before I move on to this code, if you look in the chat again, um, and if you're still having errors with uh, the original code listing the SDS, I see in the chat there's another, there's a fix for the print error, just moving that first square bracket. Let me open up that code again. This first square bracket, moving it from before the word print to after. So if you want to try that and rerunning. Um, and um, if you're running this with Python 2.7, Spider should indicate uh, where you have a problem with the red cross on the line. And when you fixed the, the issue, the cross will disappear after the file is saved. Okay, so reading OMI and two or SO2 at a given location. So here is where we're again reading on our file list. We're reading column amount NO2 or column amount SO2 PBL at the given location we're going to give to the code. When we run this code, it's asking us to process the first OMI NO2 file. I'm going to say yes. And it's giving us the range of latitude and longitude contained in this file. So we looked at the map earlier, so I'm going to enter in the latitude I'd like to analyze. Uh, we said 30 degrees north and 100 degrees west, which is going to be negative 100. And here is the nearest OMI pixel centered at this latitude and longitude. The value in that pixel is 3.9 times 10 to the 15th. And there are nine valid pixels. So it's surrounded by valid pixels. And here are the statistics for those. And there are 25 valid pixels in a five by five grid centered at my location. And here are the statistics for those. <clears throat> so <clears throat> roughly about right around four times 10 to the 15th for this day at this location. Processing the next OMI NO2 file. Again, the range of latitude and longitude, we're gonna enter the same 30 and negative 100. And on this day, it has a relatively similar uh, value of column F, troposphere column in O2, where this is actually total column. Um, so this is about four times 10 to the 15th. And again, there are nine valid pixels around this point in a three by three grid and 25 valid pixels in a five by five grid. So moving on to the SO2, I pointed out that most of the SO2 showed low values. So for our first point, we're going to enter in 30 north and about 45 east. Here's the nearest OMI SO2 pixel. 
and it's giving a small negative value. And there are nine valid pixels around this location where the average is about 0 0.05. So very low values. And in a five by five pixel, you see it, it jumps up a little bit to 0.3. So I want to show kind of the variability in this file. So I'm going to actually rerun this code and I'm going to skip the two and no two files, skipping the first file, skipping the second file. And we want to process the SO2 file again, except this time we're going to look at 33 north and 45 east. Actually, I remember it being higher. Did I write down the wrong one? Yes, I did. I'm going to rerun it again because it was very high. Skipping this, skipping this. Thirty-five north and forty-five east. Okay. So for this, right around in a five by five grid, we see we're picking up the average value is fifteen Dobson units, corresponding to that very large um, oil fire, showing the high variability you're seeing within just one file. So I've gone over all the codes. Oh, I do want to mention, um, I see a lot of questions always about automating these codes. Um, auto, uh, if you want to automate these, a quick way would just be to take out the interactive components within um, each of these codes. And you can quickly generate maps or the CSV files as you need. So I am going to do a quick poll to see how everybody is doing before we move on. OK, it looks like about 80% have are able to follow along and are able to duplicate what they're seeing. That's great. For the remaining about 20%, I'm sorry, I'm, I'll, Paul is going to talk shortly. I'll try. Uh, to address some of your issues in the Q&A. Um, so this sort of concludes this portion of session three. Pawan is now going to cover some future sensors um, that will be uh, available now or in the near future. So Pawan, if you want to take the uh, screen. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, Okay, everyone. Uh, let's see if I can find myself here. Okay. So, few things before I go over my presentation, which is, let me find it first. Okay. So just want to make sure there are a few things. We we saw there were difference between uh, Python version 3.6 and Python version 2.7. So these are some minor differences uh, arises due to the change in the way syntax works between the two version of Python. Uh, if you just search online, uh, with the error message, you will find the solution very quickly. That's the easiest way to actually debug the code. There are because people have gone through this lot uh, in various Python communities, so there are ready-made solutions available. I hope some of the solution other participants had provided or we provided through the chat window might be useful you know, for people to fix their code. And again, these are just you know, examples and the idea is that you take these example and work through on these codes uh, modify to suit your own needs or 
for example people want to do a smaller area so you can actually go into the code and change the minimum maximum lat long range and it will provide you the data for that range if you want to change the projection of map you can do that if you want to grid the data there are examples of that so uh, i hope this this these uh, all the codes provided in session two and session three today both for MODIS aerosol data and for OMI and O2 and S2 data can serve as a base uh, for your research or for your data analysis or for your air quality uh, forecasting needs or wherever you would like to start using some of the satellite data. We will be happy to help further, but I, on the error message or more uh, analysis tools in future webinar series or through the offline interaction. But again, if you are uh, facing some error related to the Python code, uh, uh, I would strongly recommend that uh, spend some time looking on the internet, uh, searching for solution, try to debug the code, uh, get help from the people around you who might have better understanding about the programming. And even if you don't get anything, then please write to us and we will try to help. Uh, but uh, first we recommend that you spend some time understanding the code and uh, debugging it by yourself. That will actually uh, help you to understand the code much better and then it will be things will be faster for you when you do this next time around. Okay, and there are some specific questions. We'll take those questions towards the end. Both Melanie and I will take, depending on which question we have. And so right now, I want to spend 10 minutes uh, to talk about some of the other sensors. Uh, in this series, we only actually use data from two sensors, MODIS and OMI. Uh, and only the aerosol data and the NO2 and SO2 data. But there are a number of other sensors uh, out there. And there are new missions which are in planning stage at various planning stage, uh, which will provide very useful air quality information in near future. So I just want to very quickly go over some of those. Again, not all, I'm not covering all of this, those, but I will just cover some of these, which will be really, really useful for air quality application. Okay, so let me go through this PPT. Again, this PPT is available on the training web page. You can download it under the week uh, session three. This is called other sensors, uh, I think. So the first sensor which I'm going to talk is the VIRS. Uh, VIRS is a uh, very similar instrument as uh, what we see from the model. It's a multi-wavelength imager. And the wavelength, number of wavelength in VIRS are smaller as compared to uh, MODIS. Uh, but they have a similar wavelengths to detect the aerosols. So the VIRS stand for visible infrared imaging radiometer. The good thing about the VIRS is that it's a swath width. If you notice the swath width here, if you notice the swath width of the VIRS, it's much larger than MODIS. In case MODIS is 2200 kilometer width, VIRS is 3000 kilometers. And the pixel resolution also actually is about 750 meter resolution. In case of MODIS, Sun Channel has a half kilometer resolution, so you can say MODIS is superior, but VIRS is throughout 750 meter resolution, which, which helps a lot. The other advantage of VIRS on MODIS is the pixel at the age people who have attended the basic remote sensing webinar they know that the, as you move from nadir location from the center of the image towards the edge of the image the pixel size increases so in case of modis it's it goes 0.5 kilometer can go to 2 kilometer pixel size in case of VIRS, it's only increased by a factor of two there are some resampling is done so that those are actually uh, better handled uh, in VIRS. So this is again a, uh, there are actually two VIRS right now orbiting. Uh, one of them is uh, launched in 2010 and the another one was launched actually just a few months back and it is a, uh, it's called JPSS-1. So this will be a new, uh, new VIRS. And I will show you actually some images from that. 
okay let me clear all the drawing here so in order to show you that uh, the to whatever reason my slide okay here this is this image just give you a very rough idea about what is the advantage of yours as you can see on the modis on the bottom c uh, there are data gaps or uh, they called orbital gaps in the tropics where there is no data is obtained because the orbit shift from one orbit to another because of the swath which is limited 2300 kilometers as you noted in previous slide, VS has a 3,000 kilometer swath width, so that you can see there is a no data gap in VS, and that's one of the big advantage using VS over Modis that it can it provides complete global coverage on every single day. So, and then you have much more overlaps on the polar areas. You can get actually uh, more than two, three observation on a given day and in the tropic at least one observation every day so there are two things i want to explain is one is the how the uh, how the pixels stretch at the edge of the image can actually change your view of looking aerosols in the atmosphere so what you see here is on the top is veers image and against the veers data are actually stored for 86 seconds for formatting purpose or for data storage purposes whereas modis data are stored for five minutes that's why you see much bigger uh, coverage in modis as compared to veers but it doesn't mean that modis has a bigger coverage it's just the, the data presented here for modis is five minutes of the data whereas the veers data is just 86 second worth of the data now i want to point out the uh, age of the swath so the age is color coded uh, is actually circled on the both viewers and modis and these are the just zoomed in version of the image for those circled area so again the top one is more uh, viewers data this is at six kilometer bottom one is the modis data okay so there is a typo here this should not be dr this is actually modis data at 10 kilometer spatial resolution so this edr six kilometers should not be there we'll correct it and upload uh, the new version on the website so uh, i think we did this wrong but this is a modis image on and the top is the veers image what you see on the veers image is because it's a high resolution six kilometer you can see fine scale features and you will see that the pixels at the edge of the image are not a stretch whereas the mode is you can see there is a stretching going on at the edge as compared to the uh, inner part of the image so that is advantage of veers another advantage of veers is that veers has a two product one is at six kilometer resolution and one is at 750 meter resolution which is a sub one kilometer product which is can be really useful and you can see in this example that at six kilometer uh, you hardly see the plumes you can see the big picture but as you go to the 750 meter resolution you can actually identify many many small plumes in this image which is very difficult to see in the six kilometer product so again the high resolution part of the viewers is very very useful for air quality monitoring Veers also has a smoke mask it's called it's based on the uh, it's a qualitative mask saying that certain aerosols in the image are either smoke or non-smoke and this is very useful when you are monitoring fires long range transport of smoke uh, wildfires or even the uh, crop uh, fields fire this can be very useful these are based on the spectral and spatial thresholds uh, in the different uh, channels in which viewers makes measurement and in this image particularly the smoke mask is actually presented as the light pink thin smoke and uh, if you see the uh, the bright pink or magenta color it shows the thick smoke so you can see the there's a lot of smoke particles in the south uh, southeast united states and also on the northwest united states and canada and this is during one of the fire seasons uh, we had this uh, smoke so this product is also available from viewers so it can be really useful for air quality certain air quality monitoring applications 
the ghost 16 and himavari these are two another senses which are actually geostationary so uh, over last uh, two decade or so uh, satellite remote sensing community has been heavily focused on making measurement of aerosols or air quality from the polar orbiting satellite like modis veers omi these are all in polar orbiting sites it means they take measurements for entire globe and there will be either one or less than one measurement per day from those sensors but one of the one of the typical problem we have seen in their quality that it required continuous monitoring you need me measurement at more frequent time interval every 10 minute 15 minute or every one hour epa does monitor air quality for every one hour so there is a need to have high temporal resolution measurement with the similar accuracies as you can get from the polar orbit satellite in recent time, uh, both NOAA and US, NOAA NASA joint partnership, and in Japan, this JAXA, uh, Japanese Space Agency has launched a very advanced uh, imager which have uh, spatial resolution equivalent to MODIS and VIRS, and they also have those spectral channels required to retrieve aerosol values. Uh, the quality of those retrievers is very close to what you get from polar orbiting satellite. Uh, but the advantage of these sensors is that you can get every 10, 15 minute observation. So the two sensor, GOES-16, which is now called GOES-East, provide every 10, every 15 minute entire disk uh, on the which is shown on the left side so every 15 minute you have observation if you are only required for the conus reason then there is that observation is available every five minutes so you can clearly monitor every single air mass movement from one place to another place uh, we do not have this high quality data in the central part of the globe uh, covering the africa and the europe and india uh, part part of the india but there are plans to launch uh, similar quality of sensors uh, in next two to two to five years uh, either by india or european agencies to cover this region uh, over the asia we just covers uh, part of india and uh, all the way from australia to the uh, russia this sensor provides every 10 minutes and the Himavari 8 and 9, actually there are two Himavaris right now in the orbit, is very similar or almost identical to GO-16 in terms of the number of channels, in terms of the resolution, in terms of the data quality. So keep an eye on the data product from these two sensors. They have been recently launched the data. There are data products out there and they are people are still trying to evaluate their quality and uh, performance for air quality applications this is just an example showing if you have this go 16 imager uh, now this is a fire event from the last year uh, or in uh, in the western united states and canada and you can see actually this if you have this very high temporal resolution data you can actually monitor the start of the fire and how the smoke is transporting over the time and if you can put this information into air quality forecasting models then essentially you can provide very accurate air quality forecast in the all the regions which are affected by these fires so this is really really powerful next generation of air quality monitor uh, monitoring will be available from this geostationary sensors. Uh, this is another example. I think people might have seen this earlier also, but this is from the Himavari sensors. And I hope this movie works. Doesn't look like it's working on. Okay. So this is from Himavari showing the part of India uh, where the sm smoke and pollution and fog over the northern india you can see actually on this image due to whatever reason it's not working but uh, uh, this uh, this movie of this image is available on the website located here on the bottom uh, so you should be able to do it uh, in your own time uh, sorry I'll, i don't know why it's not working but uh, anyway i'll just move on 
it looks like my computer is frozen which is not good now the next sensor i want to talk is called trop omi it's uh, very similar to omi sensors it's launched by european space agency uh, just a few months back uh, they haven't still released the data yet uh, but the data will be released soon but this is really a next generation of omi so what you see here on the right side is a different spatial resolution uh, of the sensors which are very similar in terms of the spectral measurement as to the trop -omy. so the biggest one here is the skemoki which was launched very early in the time and it has a very big pixel size to 300 kilometer pixel size then you see the gom 2 there was another schemaki which was higher resolution and then you can see the omi which is 13 by 24 kilometer in the blue uh, which was considered high resolution uh, sensor at the time of the launch as compared to its uh, uh, previous sensor but now you have this trop omi which is very seven kilometer by seven kilometer in resolution and this is going to really change the way we identify different sources of this no2 so2 on the ground uh, or even some of the aerosol monitoring so the good thing about the trop omi that it uh, operates in the uh, UV and visible part of the solar spectrum so you can actually uh, not only monitor trace gases but you can also actually retrieve high quality aerosols data from this uh, again this data is not yet available but they will be available in next few months uh, this is just showing an example again what is the important of uh, high resolution and how tropomi is going to help us uh, this is simulated data from tropomi on the right side on the left side is the omi and this is just showing the no2 map uh, and you can see on the left side is actually because of the coarser resolution of omi there are a lot of features in this image which are kind of hidden or smooth or looks more homogeneous but if you see the same part of the world in higher resolution instrument like trop omi then what you see is you can see the fine scale features you can see the gradients special gradients uh, within uh, those hot spots uh, where the values are very high uh, shown as the dark red color so those are really really uh, good uh, applications to look this uh, gradients in pollution and to identify specific sources trop omi will be really useful uh, this is another example of showing aerosol plume uh, uh, from the trop omi uh, one thing to remember that the trop omi actually flies five minutes behind the wear sensor so wear is making measurements and just five minutes behind wear trop omi is flying in the similar same orbit so whatever wear is looking trop omi is going to look but since trop omi does have uv vents so veers will pro and veers does not have uv vents so if you combine the measurement from the veers and trop omi you can do a lot of things uh, so you can combine the information from the two sensors and provide many many more geophysical parameter over a given location this is just showing fires from the california uh, la area fires uh, last december 12 2017 you can see the smoke plume uh, i hope it is visible uh, this is your smoke plume on the veers image and the good thing about the trop omi which is on the right side is that it exacts it actually exactly match to the aerosol index parameter which is from the trop omi you can see even a fine scales uh, and the good thing about the aerosol index from trop omi or even from omi is that it does provide aerosol information even if there is a cloud because the aerosol index does not really uh, it can be calculated under all sky condition if there is cloud the aerosol index will become negative and if there is aerosol, aerosol index will become positive so you can see actually the blue colors in this image which is denoted as negative aerosol index so this is going to be very game changing instrument in terms of how we see uh, or monitor air quality from the ground from the sorry space 
Okay, so let's the next one. Uh, there are uh, efforts to uh, make a constellation of satellite uh, which will provide high temporal and spatial resolution data throughout the globe. And it's uh, there are three sensors right now in that constellation. One is Tempo, which will provide data over uh, United States. Hourly data, Sentinel-4, uh, which will also provide hourly data only over Europe and then the gems uh, from the Korean space agency which will provide hourly air quality data over much of the Asia. So once these all these three sensors are planned to be launched in next three to five years and they will actually provide very high quality uh, air quality data both trace gases and aerosols uh, every every hour. So this is uh, one of the few first generations of dedicated air quality missions planned uh, and they will be launched and the, once the data will start coming from this sensor uh, it will change uh, everything in air quality monitoring. This is just some more specification about the sensors tempo, which is tropospheric emission monitoring of pollution. It will be launched by the United States. It will have a very high spatial resolution, all the way from two kilometers to four to five kilometers. It will operate from UV spectral channels to the visual channels range so that you can actually see both. Uh, you can see actually both uh, trace gases as well as aerosols and the expected launch date is 2021 as of now. There is another very interesting sensor uh, which was just uh, uh, selected uh, to be launched uh, uh, by 2021. It's called Maya, multi-angle imager for aerosols. And this will be a unique instrument. It will have a uh, multiple angle imaging capabilities just like the miser instrument currently on board on terra satellite but it will also have a polarization which will help actually to separate different types of aerosols uh, large versus dust versus non-dust and maybe some other uh, you will be able to distinguish between more type of aerosols uh, and it will be really a step uh, ahead in terms of the uh, pieces of information about the aerosol particle in the atmosphere as we know. Uh, this sensor will be actually not provide global coverage, but it will be operated on a specific targeted and the, those targets that were Id already identified. There are 20 or 30 big cities all around the world which have been identified where the sensor will make measurements. So this is a more targeted measurements and the idea is to use this high resolution measurement over these cities to study the health impact of aerosols or the uh, PM2.5 or the particulate matter uh, on various kind of health um, health health effects like birth outcomes or cardiovascular or respiratory disease and even premature death. So this will be a uh, very very advanced instrument. Uh, making measurement only over selected targets uh, to provide actually the uh, to see how we can use the space based technologies to analyze the impacts of health uh, impacts of air pollution on human health i think that's all i have with this uh, i will actually will close this uh, presentation mode and now we'll take over the cash question answer. Uh, I will give mic to Melanie first. She can take the question which are relevant to uh, Omi, and then I will come back and probably answer other uh, modis related questions. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, let's start with answering questions. The first question here is, how can I know the correct intercept and slope to calculate the PM2.5 from AOD for my study region? So this is very, very good question. 
there are many different ways one i would strongly recommend uh, on our rc website we have conducted a specific webinar on how to get pm 2.5 from aod observation it's called advanced webinar we have done this is in 2016 i believe uh, please go watch the recording go over the material from that webinar that will give you a lot of information on how to do this now the second option is you perform the analysis if you have some ground measurement at your locations or region of interest and then use those slope and intercept for that region the third option is please try to search for literatures uh, journal published papers people have done uh, this analysis for various regions all around the world and you might able to find this information slope and intercept and some of the published work uh, those are the three options for you and uh, i would rec again recommend to do some more research uh, on looking by the papers uh, so that you can get uh, appropriate information The next question, how can we run the code without selection of Y and uh, for yes and no each time? Uh, this is very simple. Right now, the codes are set up to take the uh, input from the command line from the users so that users can make the decision. Uh, it's very simple. You can go inside the code and ch change that. And that's... Uh, you can either just say uh, whatever input variable they are reading the y and no just comment that and give a y or n value there and it code will not ask that and it will by default run or you can do some also more more advanced things there so that the code can run automatically for hundreds of thousands of files uh, without uh, asking you every time yes or no Okay, the next question, I will let Melanie answer. Okay, can I calculate CO2, NO2 content for any specific gas for regional scale? Okay, I'm, I'm assuming uh, the question is supposed to say SO2. Um, uh, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the question is asking. So if you're calculating, say, a regional mean, um, then you could use the values contained within the files to calculate various statistics that you might be interested in. Um, but if you're going to do anything like try to grid um, the level two data and then average it, that's something that needs to be done pretty carefully. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, I think so. Just to add on what Melanie said is, uh, uh, and this also applicable to uh, mode aerosols data as well as NO2, SO2 data. There are uh, uh, there are ways in which you can calculate region. One is you can define the latitude longitude boundaries of the region, uh, either in a rectangle or a, a polygon shape or sometimes people also like to calculate that for a specific shape like administrative boundaries country boundaries or state boundaries or district boundaries or county uh, so you could actually do those kind of sophisticated thing as well but to do that you have to really modify your code a little bit more and again look for search on internet and you will find some of those solutions how to extract the data for certain boundaries uh, uh, if you are looking course resolution of the data uh, the giovanni service of nasa does provide that kind of service for limited shape files to extract the data but those are again level three course resolution data uh, if you are interested in level two data which we discussed here then you have to do that by yourself the next question number four is i think we already addressed how can we get the local intercept value of aodpm 2.5 
question number five uh, is basically if you want to download yes there are ways to download uh, but it will be uh, we do not provide direct link to download but when you are brought when you are running webcasting or running that recording from your browser uh, you can actually capture the screen or you can use some software and we don't uh, have any problem with that um, but i think the direct downloading links may not be available what can you say about omi aod data om arrow okay. so om arrow is a aerosol product from omi sensor uh, it is uh, product comes out from the knmi the european uh, or the netherlands uh, another uh, agency in netherland who actually is a uh, pi or the main agency who developed the omi sensor so it's from their agency that products comes uh, it's a multi spectral channel uh, based aerosol algorithms which use 18 different channels to retrieve aerosol optical depth and other aerosol related parameters i don't have much idea about the quality of the products probably you have to look again for the literatures or browse through their website to get more information on that uh, but the data is available to download uh, from the nasa earth data which we have where, where other omi data is available nasa also has similar product called om a r u v omar omar ruv it's a very similar product as um, arrow uh, only difference is they use different types of algorithm to get the aerosols information so there are two different products from omi on the aerosols uh, and i think that's true for other uh, trace cases as well okay melanie do you want to take the next one i actually have no idea <laughs> why no2 isn't reported in dobs units and so2 is <laughs> i tried googling to, in advance of this question okay maybe you know? maybe we can ask uh, the people who actually um, produce yeah we can data. ask the actual retrieval people and um, all of these q and a's are going to be available uh, on the RSET, on the training website. So we'll try and find the answer to this question and update it. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Elizabeth, I cannot see your uh, I think here. Let me see it here. Okay. The next question. okay let me read it uh, it is possible to use the data of modis for my country that is guatemala and what method i advise to use for adjustment of data they are more real since i have now the point geographic with the spectrosmetry data for pm10 and pm2.5 uh, okay i don't think i understand completely the question number eight uh, but again, the answer is very similar. Uh, that all the modis data is available everywhere in the world, so it should be available at your in your country as well. Uh, in order to calculate PM 2.5 from AOD, you will need some kind of local AOD PM 2.5 relationships, or you have to uh, look for the literatures if you can find people. Other people have done anything that. Uh, you can also uh, check the quality of modis data by uh, going on of those uh, algorithm web page which i discussed in the last session and i think i also responded this question in individually there are two websites dot.target.gsfc.nasa.gov and gblue.gsfc.nasa.gov those two website does provide some information on the global validation results of their product. Question number nine. The data of PM2, PM10 and PM2.5, we have them on annual basis. In what role play the PM10 that are data from WHO? Uh, 
I will actually take a pass on that question because I'm not really sure what exactly you're trying to ask there. Uh, there's a PM 2.5 data from WHO which comes out of as a combination of uh, model satellite and ground but it's only available for one year 2014. Uh, other data which is available on P uh, WHO website they are either reported by the individual countries uh, over specific stations uh, and I think you will be able to find more information on WHO website but I, I do not have much more details on those. Okay, question 10, uh, it's a long one. There are many disease associated with air quality. The smallest aerodynamic particle directly influence the alveoli of the human being. From the epidemiological point of view, the casual agent cannot be proven. However, advances in science such as the application of this online training contributes a lot. Among other pollutants, we talk about volatile organic pollutants and persistent organic pollutant. In addition to obtaining data through Python, it is it will be possible to obtain this data at the level of shapefile, shape for QGIS, ArcGIS, or other free software. Okay, uh, thank you for your comments. So the short question is: Can we extract the data? Uh, using either Python or any other uh, software for a specific shape uh, file which can be used in uh, GIS software. So the short answer to that, that we do not have any ready-made software uh, as, as for my knowledge, uh, uh, which can do this job uh, for you. Uh, but if you again search internet, you will find uh, soft, uh, Python script which will read shape file and which will read your uh, corresponding data sets and will extract the data uh, for that particular shape file. You might have to change few things in the, those codes, uh, but we do not have a ready made code to do that, uh, at least for the level two data. Uh, there are options for level three, which I mentioned earlier. Okay, Melanie, you want to take on question 11? Actually, uh, I think I want to tack on a little bit onto question 10, because I think the question is also, um, is there data available for VOCs? Um, sure, and the, um, so the short answer to that is not really. Um, formaldehyde is sometimes used as an indicator of VOC availability, um, but as for higher organics, um, we just don't have the ability to measure those from space. Um, even the tropospheric column uh, formaldehyde product from OMI um, isn't really supposed to be used on a daily basis, um, more, more, more on monthly timescales. And again, that's the column, not the surface level. Um, okay, so for question 11, um, how to process the averaging kernel from OMI and O2? So a, a lot of people when comparing model output with OMI um, use what's called an averaging kernel on their model output for a more appropriate comparison. Um, Satellite observations are inherently more sensitive to certain altitudes of the atmosphere than others. So using an averaging kernel uh, can help you. It, it basically, it turns your model output into what the instrument would actually see. Um, for the OMI and O2 data, um, I think it's actually recommended to not use the averaging kernels to do this. Um, they recommend instead uh, using the provided scattering weights in the files and essentially recomputing 
the vertical column density. So in order to compute uh, a vertical column density, uh, within the file is contained the slant column, the, I'm sorry, the slant column density uh, and the scattering weights. Uh, and the scattering weights are used to compute an air mass factor. And these air mass factors can be used in combination with the slant column densities to compute a vertical column density. When we are writing up uh, this q and I will I can post a link to a, uh, an article that can describe this procedure. Essentially, you can use your model output to sort of uh, recalculate a vertical column density using your model output as the a priori information. And this, I think, is what they advise people to do. OK, question 12. How can I resample OMI, how can I resample SWATH OMI data to a grid GeoTIFF format? Um, as for the GeoTIFF part, I think Pawan kind of answered that I don't think we have a tool to do that. Um, but if you would like gridded OMI data, it is available from the Giovanni website for both NO2 and SO2 at coarser resolution than we've talked about here. Okay, when evaluating EOD, we saw a reasonably strong correlation. Do any OMI parameters predict ground level concentrations of gas in a similar way? So uh, for SO2, the tropospheric column SO2, um, I'm sorry, the column, PB, the column SO2 PBL product is meant to represent uh, the column as if the SO2 plume is nearest the surface. So that's going to be the most relevant for air quality in terms of uh, near surface emissions. For NO2, um, as I stated earlier, uh, NO2 is relatively short-lived on the order of hours to days. So it tends to be most abundant in the lowest levels of the atmosphere and have very high spatial variability around its sources. So NO2 is a good example of a quantity that that surface value can be related to the column. This is usually done using other information from an atmospheric model. For example, taking the surface value and column value from a model, that ratio, and then applying it to your measured, your observed column value to calculate an estimated surface value. Um, okay, question 14, is data loss valid for OMI AOD data? Um, if this is if this refers to the row anomaly, any row anomaly um, feature is filtered out uh, for all of the OMI data, I believe. Okay, so the question 15, are there any, there any free available models to predict much 
find relationship between PM 2.5 and AOD than a mere linear relationship. So the answer is yes and no uh, because it depends on where you are. Uh, there have been a lot of research uh, and people have done over the United States just because there's a lot of ground measurements available. So people have tried, uh, gone beyond the linear uh, relationship, linear models. They have used multilinear regression, machine learning, and combination of model and satellite. And those data have been created by various groups. Uh, they are available uh, on a daily and annual scales. Uh, there is a one from the NOAA. It's called, uh, it's a, it was a joint project between NOAA, NASA, and EPA. And those data are created on a daily basis. It's called IDEA project. So if again, search for IDEA NOAA, uh, and you will be able to find those uh, there. Uh, other parts of the world, I would say, uh, is still like uh, a lot of uh, these uh, more sophisticated models are not available uh, and people are still in more research mode. There have been a lot of work even in China also. Uh, people have created high resolution PM 2.5 product from AOD using more complicated, uh, sophisticated models. Uh, so I think they are available in regions where you have a lot of ground data sets, uh, but in regions where the ground data are not available, uh, they still rely on the models, uh, global, uh, global models. Okay, uh, question 16, can I find OMI data at let's stack? And uh, no, the uh, let's stack only actually provide models data. To get the OMI data, you have to go to the Earth data. Uh, you can still use the same login password. And how to get the data, the instructions are provided in a PPT, which you can download it from this uh, uh, training web page. Uh, and that will uh, actually guide you how to get the data. Where's AOD data validated over Indian region? Yes, the data is uh, right now. VIRS data is uh, processed by NOAA. Uh, they have validated uh, our global region, including India. Uh, the data quality looks good. Uh, I would strongly recommend to read the papers. If you are interested, please sh uh, send me an email and I can send you the specific uh, validation paper from the VIRS uh, AOD validation over global regions. And that will provide you more information on that. How to extract a smoke mask from VIRS data? Uh, again, this is a product uh, available through the IDEA website, which I just uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, over the US, uh, if you are looking for global, uh, there is a product from them uh, available through the NOAA class website. Uh, uh, I don't remember the web address at top of my head. Uh, but uh, if you Google, you will find it or again, send us an email and we'll be able to send you the proper link. Question number nine, is it re reasonable to assume these codes can easily modify to use for the ozone returns from aqua? Yes, you can modify easily to get the ozone data as well. Where can we best access the VIRS data? VIRS data is available from the NOAA uh, uh, class website. Let me just find the website and I can actually paste it here. Okay, unfortunately, because of the US government shutdown, the website is down, right? But it's called NOAA class data download, and you can actually search it and you should be able to find it. Okay, why doesn't the Giovanni website have modest three kilometer product for aerosol optical data? 
So the Geo Money website is designed to handle level three data only. Because if you go to the level two and level three, uh, level two data, high resolution data, the data volume become very large and it is very, very hard to handle in near real time. That is why Giovanni only host level three graded product. Uh, there have been uh, other tools uh, which are in development right now, uh, which will actually perform some of the similar uh, tasks as Giovanni with the level two data, but they are still in uh, development. Question 22. Uh, okay, so before adjusting some superficial data with the data of mod is, we can consult you for you any doubt that may arise since the only way to learn your application is to exercise on the subject. And if that were the case, we would contact them by mail. Yes, please contact us by email if you have more questions. Uh, we'll be happy to re respond. Okay, Melan, you want to take next to one? Sure. Uh, when OMI loses 50% of the data, I think more data is lost near the tropical zone. In that case, how can we assure the quality of the product? How can we ensure that the data quality is good? Um, as far as uh, the row anomaly, that is already filtered in the NO2 and SO2 data. And um, that'll be indicated by the fill values, which are very, very large negative numbers. Uh, the exact numbers I've included on the slides that you can download. As far as data quality, um, if you look at the tables that I've included in the PowerPoint, those are what the is. Uh, those are what the developers advise users to use as far as filtering the data using parameters such as uh, radiative cloud fraction, terrain reflectivity, and solar zenith angle. Um, as far as the okay, so question twenty four. Uh, the wavelengths used, I'm assuming this means the wavelengths used to measure NO2 and SO2. And uh, NO2 is measured in the visible and near UV from about 400 to 465 nanometers. And SO2 is measured uh, in the wavelength region about 310 to 340 nanometers. Okay, uh, question 25. Is there an algorithm for AOD that does not discard the image due to cloudiness? Uh, okay, the short answer is no, but there are algorithms to detect aerosols above the cloud. Uh, if there is a cloud underneath the, uh, if there is aerosol layer underneath the cloud, then it is very hard. It's, really not possible to see from the passive imager but if you look the data from active sensors like calypso which has a laser uh, it can actually provide you the vertical profile uh, and if the cloud is not very thick uh, then it can see the aerosol layer underneath the cloud and will provide you an optical depth value for that but from the passive sensors, it's not possible. Drop OMI could be used to find concentration of PM 2.5. If so, where could I find the information? Uh, at this point, uh, Drop OMI data has been has not been released. Uh, once they release the data, we will know more about uh, what and what we can do and what we cannot do from that. Okay, I think uh, that's all we have. Uh,
today. I hope everybody was able to run the code. I know there were some uh, people having issues with either some minor errors related to print or by changing the version between 2.7 and 3.6. Uh, those are I believe those are small uh, errors which can be easily fixed uh, by looking solution on internet. Uh, and hopefully you will be able to modify these codes to actually run and perform some of the application uh, which we discussed in session one and two little bit and three as well. Uh, some either comparison with other data sets or to perform some case study analysis. So I hope uh, this is useful uh, tomorrow or whenever we are open. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to send a survey uh, asking about specific uh, question related to this webinar series and what was useful, what was not useful. Please provide your feedback. Those surveys are very, very important for us. Uh, that they actually provide us uh, information on what needs to change in order to make this training more effective for uh, everybody who attend these trainings and uh, there are also options to suggest additional top topics on those surveys so that will also help us to plan future trainings um, and there are many different types of questions all the way from training styles presentation styles uh, to the subject specific uh, please do take those surveys. Those surveys does not take more than uh, five, ten minutes of your time, but they really provide valuable information. With that, uh, thank you everyone for attending. Thanks, Melanie, Elizabeth, Brock, and everyone for helping with this webinar. And we will see everyone probably during next training. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.